think that there's a lot of wisdom in the view that basically says, so when you look at, you know, the history of thinking about the afterlife, um, and, I, and I'll admit it's, it's been a few years since I've read some of the particulars, but in terms of generalities, it seems like there's broad agreement that for the first at least three centuries, there was a pretty broad range of views, annihilationist views, universalist views, eternal conscious torment, and some varieties within those. Certainly, at least in the West, starting with Augustine on, eternal conscious torment of those who are not Christians did become the dominant view. And, you know, historians have pointed out that this, that overlaps with the Christian faith becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire, the Constantinian Revolution. And, you know, I, I think some historians make good arguments to the effect of that that's probably not incidental or coincidental that it happened that way. I think of you of eternal conscious torment of those that are outside your faith, when you join that with political power, uh, that has enormous potential for control, social control of various kinds. If you, you know, because basically once the Christian faith becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire, to be non-Christian is the same as being non-Roman, right? And so if we can, you know, the way history has so tragically worked is that we always tend to demonize those that we have other reasons for going to war with or trying to destroy. And so I think an eternal conscious torment view, it really does force you to degrade and dehumanize the people that you think are going there. Because I don't, you know, we can't quite, at least if we have any shred of decency left within us, we can't really imagine human beings like us being tormented forever. So we, we have to think of them as like demonic somehow or monstrous or less than human. And so I think that eternal conscious torment view was very politically useful uh, in terms of solidifying the Roman Empire and to be used as propaganda against those outside of the Roman Empire, you know? Um, so I think that's, to my mind, that's probably the most dominant explanation. Now there may be some other factors in there, but I've always found a lot of plausibility in that view. It, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I, it certainly can't be an accident that that became the dominant view right around the same period the Constantinian Revolution happened, you know, within the Christian faith. It, that just, it, it can't be. Um, I think, another, as I'm thinking about this, I think another part of that is, you know, in the early Christian church, a lot of the major thinkers were heavily influenced by Greek philosophy. Um, and in particular, Plato and some of the Neoplatonists. And, you know, Plato himself had a vision of uh, some form of an afterlife punishment that involved like a purgatorial kind of state. And so a lot of these early major Christian thinkers were heavily influenced by Platonic thinking about uh, those matters. When you fast forward a few hundred years and get to people like um, Tertullian and then Augustine and some others, they were more uh, Latin based and they were, you know, a lot of those guys were lawyers um, and, you know, had a lot of legal training. And so I think certain retributive notions of justice started to kind of creep in through some other strands of thought. Um, I think that probably had a role in it as well. But I think the political explanation makes probably the most sense.